Hi, they're walking, walking in here. Hi, I can hear everybody. Excellent. Hi, Louise. Hi. Okay. Yeah, it did go quiet. I think it's because they're on mute. Okay. Turn, John, turn mine off mute. I was in the bedroom and then I moved to the front porch and then when I moved back, I couldn't get any reception. So I had to go out and come back in again. Can you hear us now? Okay. Yeah, it's echoey, but we can hear you. Okay. Okay. okay I'm just going to go into executive session while we're in there. We'll figure out the uh, guys, 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 in favor, did you go into executive session? It's real echoey. Heather. Heather. Go, go, go. 
executive session, yes? Yes. Yes. We Okay, okay, okay. Okay, well, right. you know executive session. Executive session. Thank you. Yeah, all my headphones are muted. Yeah.
you. We're all set, Josh. Yep. Heather, Louise, can you hear us? And can you talk? I'll make sure there's not a lot of echo. Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Louise. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Did you type things in right because it's not? Or it is loading, let's see. It. Well, public will just be with you in one minute. We have uh, 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 the documents loading up here so that they can be read. It's not going to load up. Just work out. Just work out. Okay. Yeah. I didn't want it to get echoed. So. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to see how to turn it on. All right. I am going to go ahead and call the uh, main meeting to order. Uh, welcome to all who have come to observe the meeting of the Iroquois Central School Board of Education. There are two periods of recognition of guests listed on the meeting agenda. The first is for comments regarding agenda items, and the second is for topics not on the agenda. Speakers may offer comments related to school ops, uh, operations and programs, but the board cannot hear personnel, complaints against individuals associated with the school system. Please address these concerns to the appropriate administrator. If you wish to be recognized, please fill out the appropriate form and turn it in to our district clerk. As per policy 1514, per public participation at board meetings, public comment by district residents is limited to 15 minutes total unless the board suspends this limit. Each person is given up to three minutes in which to address the board. And additionally, no more than three people may speak on a single topic unless the board also waives this limitation. This meeting is held in public rather than a public meeting, which means we will not be engaging in dialogue uh, with members of the community this evening. District personnel will follow up with you regarding your concerns. Rest assured, we are listening carefully and we take seriously the things that you have to say. Please demonstrate respect by speaking to the issues, sharing ideas and opinions, but not engaging in personal attacks. The board appreciates your willingness to share your concerns and your celebrations with us tonight. Please be advised that this meeting is being streamed live and the recording will be posted on our website. And with that, I'd like to call our Wales primary students, Asher and Everly. They are going to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lovely. Thank you so much. Did you get all the pictures? I did. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to our next agenda item, the student report. And, uh, this evening, we're going to hear from uh, Lucas, who's in ninth grade in the high school. Welcome, Lucas. Hello. 
My name is Lucas Keener, and I'm in ninth grade. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you about my transition from the middle school to the high school. I would first like to thank my counselors, Mrs. Langle and Mrs. Ford, for being very helpful in making the transition less stressful. One example of this is when I had some classes on my schedule that I wanted to adjust, and I was worried it was after the due date to change them. Mrs. Ford was very helpful and made the change as soon as she could. This, this helped alleviate my stress. I would also like to show appreciation to my teachers for being very easygoing uh, for the first few days of school. This let me get used to the process and helped me find my classes easier. It also permitted me time to get used to the workload of the high school. In prior years, I never really had to study at all for uh, study at all for tests unless I was worried about them. But this year was a little different and I really noticed the increase. My teachers really helped me get used to this change by slowly increasing the workload and being open and caring not to just me, but all my classmates. Having virtual learning around for the last quarter of seventh grade and most of my eighth grade year made a difficult school routine and made the transition stranger. This is because in eighth grade, the school was split into classes around 10 to 15 students per class as to maintain social, social distancing. Because of all the COVID precautions, we traveled with these classes to each, uh, from every class every day and didn't have many people in the hall at once. Once the beginning of the 2021 to 2022 school year came, everybody was walking in the halls freely and we weren't traveling with the state students uh, to every class all day long. This made the beginning of the school year very different. And still the teachers and counselors at the high school made the transition easier and more comfortable for everyone. At the beginning of the 2021 to 2022 school year, a freshman fun day was put together uh, to make the freshmen more comfortable with the high school and reduce stress. I enjoyed the station where we sat out on the tennis courts and talked about ourselves in the new year because I felt it because I feel it helped me get a feel for how everyone else was doing. We went to some other stations as well and I recently and recently I was able to give feedback to administration on that and I think the program will continue to improve for all stage, uh, for all students. Stepping up to JV and varsity sports was hard because you are competing at a higher level, but my coaches helped me and were very nice and prepared me, which allowed me to get used to the sports seasons. Having sports from three to five every day and some, uh, and some out of school activities posed, posed some challenges to get assignments done on time, but I was able to balance my time, create a routine and get things done. I believe that in the long run, sports allow you to become a better student by learning to balance time and create routines. I believe that having the ability to do more of what we want in the high school is especially exciting. Personally, I was able to accelerate in math and science while also getting to take the computer science elective. I'm looking forward to taking some more cool classes that I get to choose like food science, engineering, and AP computer science. I appreciate being trusted uh, to be more responsible, and I believe that having more freedom reduces stress and makes the high school more, uh, more fun and a better learning environment. Thank you for your time and opportunity to share my experiences. Lucas, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you for coming and giving us your update and telling us about all the things that um, were done for you and your classmates to uh, help them transition into the high school. It's really important to hear that you had a successful transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Lucas, I, you, you talked a lot about appreciation. You know, I heard that a lot as a theme in what you were saying. And I want to say, I really appreciate your perseverance with giving us the chance to work through, make the changes, not giving up. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for all during the different changes you and your classmates and everything. And, I really liked your piece in there about having a vision of what classes you wanted to take and where you wanted to go. I know it might change over the years, but appreciate that too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next agenda item is our budget presentation from Mr. Wolski, our business administrator. I'm really excited to hear this piece because I think he's, 
he's been able to put everything together with a balanced budget. Um, even even though the state has not finalized their budget, we kind of know where they're going to be with school aid from what they've said. Correct. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Uh, so yes, we're uh, presenting our second uh, work session here. Um, we presented the February meeting. We had a budget gap at that time, so hopefully we will show now that we've solved that budget gap and um, we're going to move forward with next year's budget. Uh, Iroquois vision building on tradition to support and encourage all to excel through innovation, inspiration, and inclusivity. And there's our new Iroquois mission that we have in place uh, that we saw at the last meeting as well. And our normal considerations for the budget process. Um, fourth one, of course, being future based, future focused in our planning, looking long term, not short term, at, at what changes are out there, what could impact us in the future, and making small adjustments as we go and not having big changes to deal with. Yeah, and it's, it's really important in there, too, to keep in mind that this is about students at Iroquois and what we are offering them, but in that also keeping sight of exactly what it means for the public with taxes and the burden on them to provide that uh, and every, you know really thank you to the public always for supporting and thinking of the students uh, so we, we're going to go through in this uh, this meeting the budget philosophy revenues our expenses and then the different uh, four propositions that we have this year from last meeting we left off we're going to look at the, the tax cap calculation make sure that's finalized and done and, and it is at this point uh, we're going to work through department and administrator um, budgets that they have uh, re reviewed the reserves we looked at retirements and enrollment changes and, and different changes there that, that would impact our, our spending plan for next year uh, and we monitor state aid projections and again we're not done with the budget at, at the state level just yet but we have a really good indication where it's going to be i think uh, at this point in time and then we looked at the, our BOCES projected contracts for next year Again, getting back to philosophy, um, we're looking at long-term, what's federal funding going to look like in future years, not just the, the short-term uh, ARP and the, the COVID-related funds, but the Title I, Title II, 611, 619, the things that we depend on every year to, to keep our programs going, watching those closely. We know the consumer price index is going to be, is currently 4.7%. So again, that, that hits almost every department in our in our district because you know our money doesn't go as far to buy the things that we need um, and the state aid and tax cap really does not support uh costs that are above cp uh two percent really in reality so what costs are going up 4.7 percent and our tax cap calculation has a two percent limit in one area um, we're going to go we're going to get behind every year and then we watch the new state mandates that are coming out and we watch that state aid uh, distribution philosophy and how it could impact us in the future. I think the important piece on this slide for everyone to know too is that that, that indented bullet where it says state aid and tax cap does not support CPI. Um, that is something we've been dealing with for years, continue to deal with it, and really looking to be the good financial stewards as we're providing for the students. And that's just something to be aware of how if CPI is going up and we're always under it, it just keeps compounding and building. Thankfully, we've been doing projects. The public has been supporting projects uh, like solar panels that will actually save the district money, which John always uses in building the budget to save the taxpayers um, for, you know, on their tax bills. It's interesting that the, the uh, tax cap calculation does react to uh, low CPI, below 2%. It lowers our allowable tax rate, but if it goes above 2%, it does not adjust in that above two percent to compensate uh, in our board summer uh, conference that we do we get very in depth into the reserves we go through each of these reserves and define what they're for when they were established what their purpose is how we plan to use them in the future so this is kind of a summary document that we have that goes with that in, in the green you see the column that's uh, where we hope to end this year with our reserve balances in the blue, we see what we allocate for next year uh, through our budget process to support the budget. Uh, and then we look at some, some future ideas of where we, we like to fund these different reserves and where we'd like to be long term. Uh, and again, here's the other uh, reserves that we have for employee benefits for workers comp. Uh, all the allowable reserves that we can have um, through New York State. 
Uh, good news on our physical stress, physical stress monitoring system. We are a zero score, which is a good thing. It means we don't have anything that's really impacting us that's going to cause long term. Um, have long-term impact on our finances at this point, is if that's near state's opinion. Uh, it's our opinion as well. Um, so that's good news always. When we look at the tax cap calculation, it is based on CPI. It looks at pilot payments. Uh, we have a few, not, not, nothing really significant in pilot payments, but, but there are some. Uh, there are some exemptions that were allowed and there's a tax-based growth factor that impact that. Uh, again, 4.7 on CPI, but the allowable increase um, is 2%, it's, it's, it's locked at that level. It doesn't adjust up for anything beyond 2%. We have a tax-based growth factor, which means uh, there's a number given to every district in New York State of growth, uh, whether it's through uh, new builds or just property values going up. So we're allowed to increase um, a little bit just to compensate for property values uh, and development in the area. And there are no exclusions this year because the retirement systems uh, didn't go up by a significant amount and the local capital expenditure, we, did, we have no exclusion in place for that because there is no uh, true local impact with the projects that we're doing. All this all, always results in a tax levy that can be below or above 2%. So this is the same slide as from February. We are at 2.51% uh, is our allowable levy increase. And if we look compare that to past years, it's probably the average of the last six or so years. Uh, 2.5 is about where we on average, uh, wind up. In 2016-17, that's a, a particularly low CPI year, and we were only allowed a 0.81% increase on the levy in that particular year. So this is just a, uh, a rough look at the impact tax impact of the 2.51% uh, levy increase. Uh, and we, we keep everything in place that's in place right now with the um, equalization rates and property values that we have right now, those are all going to change in the coming months, but we can only go by what we have right now. So it just shows a $200,000 market value house, of approximately a $69 increase um, when we look at a 2.51% levy increase. And what's really important for everyone to realize on this is it's an estimate. I guarantee you it's wrong um, because like John said, we, we don't have the final assessed values. We don't have the equalization rates. But as everyone knows every year, this is always pretty close. It's just not exact. And proof that we are wrong is in this next slide because when you look at the, when we get the actual equalization rates and the property values all are increasing as they have been for the last couple of years and are, they're only going up, the equalization rates uh, mean that our property values are going up and if we keep our, our there's more, more value to spread our tax levy across. So you can see over the last three years, um, we've seen that equalized tax rate actually decreasing, uh, going from 15.2 to 13.8 to 13.68. It's just showing that property values are going up uh, and that equalized tax rate is, is actually coming down because the property values are going up so quickly. And of course, your individual tax bill can vary. These are just estimates. Um, and, and we don't know those uh, how the different towns are going to do equalization rates for next year at this point. State aid, um, really this hasn't changed much since the last uh, meeting. Um, $2.1 million increase for school funding. Um, there is that catch of the governor's proposal. It includes all bus purchases to be zero emissions by 2029. I think there was a lot of publications that came out that said 2027. They've since corrected that. Uh, so any new buses that you purchase, uh, you have to be buying low, zero emission buses starting in 2029. And then you should have your entire fleet, in theory, changed over by 2035. Um, I think the Senate and Assembly proposals adjust these goals and they push them out a little farther. So that's probably what will happen in reality. And, 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 you know, to be clear with that slide too, what we are hearing from the state, um, you know, here on April 6th, that they are not looking to put any more money into foundation aid or categorical aids. So therefore, for even though the budget's not done, what we are hearing is there will not be any money from the state for Iroquois. We have to deal with what what they've given us or projected. Yeah, or nothing above what the executive budget was in January, which is for us a three percent increase on foundation aid. Right. Um, as far as uh, uh, phasing in the uh, buses, John, 
Um, is there going to be any increase in uh, transportation related aid? There's been no uh, information on that. So we would be looking at another unfunded mandate. At, at this point, it looks like that, yes. But they're, they're definitely at higher, at this point, they're buses that cost fifty seventy thousand dollars $70,000 more than a standard gas or diesel bus. Yeah. There is, is there any projected uh, um, useful life on the uh, the electric uh, buses as compared to the diesel or gas? I think there's just a few districts that are experimenting with a few, so I don't think there's a lot of data on that right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there is talk of funding the difference or taking care of, really it's more taking care of part of the difference between the two, but again, it's just talk and nothing's been solidified. <laughs> What did you say? Electric costs more than a diesel. I think about fifty thousand more. Is about fifty thousand more. Correct. Uh, so when we look at our state aid, even though the foundation aid is three percent, we know there's a lot of expense-based aids. So we're estimating our increase in reality about one point two percent. Again, because of those expense-based aids and just how we see that playing out for next year. There is federal funding in our budget. Not, it's not included in the budget, but these are separate funds that are coming to the district to kind of fund some programs that are directly related to COVID learning loss. Um, so we have an American Recovery Plan posted on our website uh, with more detailed information, but basically we're, we're you know, providing more response to intervention staffing. We have uh, after school staffing and transportation, uh, more professional development opportunities. There's literacy, literacy specialists in all three primary buildings. Um, district-wide behavior specialist, and uh, an additional social worker was added at the, to support the middle school and high school. And these are funds that are set up for just, you know, two or three years um, to be used just for those specific, uh, specific uses. And the so social worker, it was a half time for each one of them. It wasn't a plus one in each one. It was, we had a, one we were splitting, and so now there's a full time in each one. Plus one, full time? Um, the response intervention, some of those are plus one. The transportation, that would be an addition because that was the after school run so that people could stay here. Um, I don't have the slide in front of me now to see what else was on there. Yes. So what do we do at the third year? Well, these are meant to be sh short term things to address COVID learning loss, and the expectation is. You, we will either roll those into the budget in, in those years after that if you want to keep those things going, or some will have to drop off. Uh, sales tax is another revenue source that we have, and we've seen uh, this kind of steadily increasing, and we've kept our budget number in the past years kind of flat. But with inflation, consumer spending is going to actually increase because uh, prices are going up for everything. So. If sales tax is attached to the spending that people are doing, we're seeing that number go up uh, in the last two quarters that we've received state aid, uh, I'm sorry, not state aid, sales tax payments. So we're going to increase our estimate for next year by $150,000 more. Um, and I think that's a pretty safe um, estimate for our increase in sales tax revenue next year. So we look at our revenues at this point. Um, Again, the, the major piece at the bottom is tax levy, which is 2.51% increase, uh, and then state aid are around 1.3. So with, with those, you know, we have that much money to work with. So now we look at our expenses and make sure those are in line with that that money that we have. Um, we're supplying all of our supply codes at the 21, 22 levels. Again, that's a problem when CPI is 4.7. So that same amount of money for supplies doesn't get you as much. Uh, for next year, uh, staffing we do we will have one less FTE uh, at the middle school. I think that's the sixth grade section that's going to be reduced by one. Correct. Um, and we have five teaching staff retirements. So uh, since February, we've rolled those retirements in, and, and the breakage that we get from uh, a person retiring and a new person being hired. Um, we also estimate health insurance increase around five percent, with a little better than we've seen in the past years, uh, based on our experience. Uh, and we do include in this budget the scheduled one-to-one -one device replacement uh, that we've been doing for five, six years now. There is also a capital outlay project included for $100,000. It's going to address the uh, middle school five, six 
great cafeteria. Um, we are addressing this summer the firewall in there with a $100,000 project. Next summer, summer of 2023, we'll look at the, um, the, the ceiling being replaced and the flooring being replaced to kind of refresh that space quite a bit. Retirement system, um, one of these, the TRS is uh, going up slightly, the ERS is going down slightly, so they kind of are balancing each other out for next year, so we're not seeing really any significant increases in retirement system, uh, so that's a nice change as well. So when we look at our expenses, um, total budget going up about 2.19% from this year to next. And I'm gonna look a little farther into each one of these categories with some additional slides. Uh, so for general support, uh, you see the different sub areas of general support and how they're changing. Uh, you see finance is kind of high. Really that's attributed to a, uh, a reallocation, I would call it. We had used to have some um, some business office expenses that we could put in transportation. Um, and that way, you know, because you know, myself, there's a percentage of our salaries that are used for uh, to manage the transportation department. Uh, New York State's put out some new guidance on that and they don't want that being done as much as it used to be in the past. So we're reallocating, taking some expense out of the transportation budget, putting it back in the finance side. So um, it's more reallocation than an increase. Um, instructional support. Uh, the first uh, left side, we're seeing uh, instructional development. That's more professional development and, and things like that. Uh, regular instruction is our biggest category. So you're seeing a 1.5% increase in regular instruction, 3.31% uh, in students with disabilities. Uh, again, nothing really changes from previous years. That's a, a growth area that we always see additional expense in. Transportation, 2.29% increase in benefits. Again, I'll bring back up to transportation because yeah. I just think people might kind of question that one because of the gas prices or what they're seeing at sure. the gas pumps. Um, years were always conservative there because we never know where gas prices are going. So looking at the estimates, looking at the reserves that are being released, um, looking at what the gas prices are doing now. Plus, you got to remember in transportation, there's more than just gasoline for buses. There's maintenance, salaries. So all that is in there. So that is why it's not as big a number as you might expect. It's just not diesel. Um, but it's a good example of the budget practice that we have to do with the tax cap in place and our limits on revenue coming in. So we can't react every year to gas prices going up and down. Um, so we have to kind of have a number and we have to look long term and keep that number pretty consistent in the budget. Um, so we have something built in there to kind of absorb some of that increase that we're going to see next year. And the benefits, like I said, state retirement, teacher retirement, the first two, one's going down, one's going up slightly. Uh, they kind of balance out nicely. Um, health insurance, 4.8% increase uh, with our health insurance expenses, but all the other uh, benefits are staying fairly flat. So at this point, we have a balanced budget. Um, revenues matching expenses. Um, when we go to the voters in May, on May 17th, we have uh, four propositions. Proposition one is the budget, $54,984,552. We have our traditional uh, proposition number two, which is replacement of vehicles, our planned vehicle replacement. Uh, we do three or four buses per year, and we hope to change over our fleet every 10 to 12 years. Um, and that's worked very well for us in, in many ways. It keeps a consistent debt, debt service number. This is um, the board, public votes on this to, to issue a bond for the purchase of these buses. Um, three full size, one cutaway bus, wheelchair equipped. And actually backing up there from proposition two, I always get the question while I'm standing there or John's standing there because we're there all day for the vote to answer any questions anyone has. That is not the actual amount that we go out and bond because we do trade in buses. So it comes down, but we have to get permission to have the full dollar amount in there from the public because um, we don't know the trade-in amounts ahead of time. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, what is the percentage difference in purchasing a full-size electric bus compared to the standard ones that we're used to buying? Purchase price would be approximately $50,000 difference at this point in time today. 
you know, with the goal is to have us buying electric buses in tw by 2029. So how much will the price be in 2029? I, I don't know. Uh, but at this point today, it's about a $50,000 difference to buy an electric bus versus a gas or diesel. Wow. Then I guess we have to figure in uh, setting up the charging stations and all that kind of all. Absolutely, yes. That's, um, a, that's a big cost. Initial too. cost is, yes. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And then uh, <laughs> just the grid, can the grid handle all that? Uh, all those buses being charged at the same time. There's a lot of questions to still to be answered. It's, it's, that's absolutely true. Uh, so our Proposition 3 is the uh, unique one for this year. We, we were given this opportunity to, to make a purchase of some uh, property across the street. The Elma Fire substation, they call it substation number two. Uh, on this map, you can see that it's adjacent to some other property that we own across the street next to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, the purchase price proposed is $470,000. It was built in 2008 on six acres of land. Um, the source of funds is going to be district fund balance. We're not going to do borrowing or uh, specific borrowing for this project. Uh, we do always plan to end the year with, with um, fund balance that we typically put in the capital reserve. So some of that fund balance, instead of putting in the capital reserve, we'd like to make this purchase to kind of expand our footprint across the street uh, for future projects. And Doug, do you want to hit? Any points to that? Yeah, if you want to go to the next slide with this. And and, and when John said he used the word, we'd like to. And really what it does, it looks into a long range vision. Uh, we, we had a facilities committee that was looking at what can we do? Where can we build? Where can we do things in the future? And when you look at ages of buildings, there are, there are some in the buildings of grounds that really need to be replaced. Um, they're really getting the end of their life. There are other ones that are in their way of future facilities and so therefore when we look at this dollar amount you look down at the bottom and, and we say well we're saving 1.4 million well it's really hard to say we ever save money if we haven't spent it you know it's like going to the store and saying hey it's on sale and i bought this and i saved all this money we still spent money but what it does by purchasing this we do not have to go and build it then we have this additional land and so if you look at the dollar amounts above just for um, supporting the STEM room in the high school, what would be the estimated cost if, if we could do that? Right? You know, and then the other one would be for planning for future capital projects for the space, because at that point, if we didn't purchase this, we would have to be building one on our own to house these other operations. And when you put all that together, that's where we will not have to expend as much in the future to keep taking care of, keep moving the district in the correct location. And some of you say, well, those are in the future. We'll deal with them in the future. But if we go to the next slide, you can see there's really immediate gains now. So with immediate gains, one right now, it's the safety of students because we have uh, one location where we can move them off site for evacuation. We can move some back office operation over there, which would then allow for expansion of our STEM room or STEM locations, uh, centralization, centralization of buildings and grounds, which for the centralization of that, it actually makes it more efficient. It um, reduces the temporary structures. That's what I was talking about. They were built in the 1960s and it increases the care of the equipment because then they're all located together. Um, Long-term benefits, it reduces that future capital pro project cost. That's where that 1.4 on the last slide came from. There's space for, um, transportation requirements, so if that changes, we have larger bays, we could, we could move where that is as buses gets larger because we were talking about the electronic buses. How big are they going to be? How long are they going to be? We don't know. Um, and it also allows for future instructional space opportunities. And what that means, by moving buildings of grounds or there opens up outside footprint of where additions could be. So you have an immediate gain of back office operations going over there, um, building a club, and so what that means by moving back office operations out of there, we'll take my office. I'm in a classroom space. So if I was to move over there, that, that would be a back office operation. Now it's a classroom space they could grow into. We're, we're not talking about moving me over there. Um, we're talking about some other things. Um, we'll use central printing. That's down in an area right next to the STEM room. So if they were to move over there, it worked very well for deliveries and efficiency for that. But what that allows is a large space air conditioned room already that could move into a STEM facility. Um, so, so that's an immediate gain. Um, 
And so that's why you have the immediate benefits and the long-term benefits of why that would work very well, why it's really a great opportunity um, for the district that, that was unanticipated, but we were anticipating capital projects. So by using that to purchase this, we would not be using that in the capital project for future projects down the road because we've taken care of that aspect of what we talked about back in 2019 when we looked at the facilities. So in just thinking, there's some immediate gains and benefits. Absolutely. And also they can, um, with the facilities committee that um, was convened during the strategic planning process, then you can go to those people, you have temporary gains, right? And it buys you time so that you can be very thoughtful and planning for future and get community input and move forward with whatever comes out of that. I think that was said perfectly um, because that's exactly what it's for. And we already heard what they said, this moves in the direction they say. And now when we have a discussion with them, I'd really like to meet with them over the summer um, when, when and hopefully this happens and is supported because now they can really sink their teeth into it because they can see the opportunities of what's going to happen. So, yes. And it expands our footprint by six additional acres six added acres. to the 11. Correct. Right? That's so, a big space. Oh, it's huge over there yeah. because then it also allows for future spaces over there. What we have to move, um, move something else. We have the space to do that, which does not impact the athletic fields and things we have in place already. So again, you're providing for, because it always has to come back to students, you're providing the same opportunities for the students and taking care of the future. So that is Proposition 3. Uh, we'll ask the voters to approve that purchase uh, of sub fire substation uh, across the street for $470,000. Sorry, I'm just going to add one more thing. With the um, price of real estate escalating uh, so quickly, it's the sooner the better, right? I, <laughs> I think everyone's doing that. Everyone's right now buy each other right now on property. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Or I'll so, bid. <laughs> so the fourth one, we have four propositions this year. So the fourth one is a change to our, our board um, election election process, which is to go to at-large voting, um, beginning not with this coming uh, year, 2223, but with the next school year, 2324. Um, and to summarize what we currently do, currently, uh, candidates seek to petition for a specific board member seat. The highest vote count among those petitioning for that individual seat will win that position. So what are the possible issues with that that we have seen in the past? Uh, some that we just know could happen and we, we want to maybe avoid the possibility of these things happening. Um, it is possible that with two seats open, you can have multiple candidates for one seat and we could have no candidates going for the other seat. Could that happen? It could, it could happen if people petition to go on and then they drop out as the vote gets close. We've, we've seen something like that happen in the past. Um, they can create indecision among candidates. They want to know who's leaving and who's staying. Um, current board members, if they're leaving or not. So, so you know, they could be uh, trying to find out that information um, on inside information on who's leaving, who's staying, uh, to influence which seat they really run for. Uh, it's also possible that a candidate um, with the second highest vote count does not get a seat because they didn't. They weren't running for that particular for the right seat. Um, we really want the top vote getters to get the seats. Is what this would do. So what Proposition Four would do? It would change to at-large voting. Uh, vacancies on the board would not be considered separate offices. You'd just be running for uh, the seat. Uh, popular. The, the two seats are open. The two um, highest vote getters. Highest vote getters get those two seats. Simple as that, I guess. Um, nominating petitions would not be specific to any board seat. Uh, again, so if two board seats are open, candidates with the two highest vote counts get those two seats. And that happens every other year? Yes, we're on a pattern of one board seat being open one year and two the next year, and it keeps going one, two, one, two. It, it, it's actually like, because there's seven members, it's like two ones and then a double and then a one and then a double. Oh, yeah. I, th I think of how it works mathematically, so it's almost... Almost. You know, 
every one and a half years. <laughs> this is a good year to do it, though, because it's not effective. There's only one absolutely. seat that's open. Correct. Which brings us to the last issue is a board member seat is open. Michelle Hobie's seat is open at the end of this year. Um, there is information at the website on how to uh, petition for that seat. Um, and you can contact um, Ms. Speck to get more information in our district office. Petitions are due by April 18th at 5 o'clock. A uh, reminder who our, our governor is and how to contact them if you need to, Kathy Hochul. And our local um, representatives, Patrick Galvin and David DiPietro. And, you know, and right now that's a good time because the governor has put out her um, budget already, but the Senate and Assembly are still discussing. I, I really think it's great for you to reach out, tell them you're a member of Iroquois, tell them you're interested in the budget, even if you're just doing that, um, because then when I talk to them about the needs of the district, they know there's a lot of active people that are paying attention to politics and what they are doing in the Iroquois district. Um, so, so that really makes that happen. You know, even if you just say, you know, please support the schools, please talk to the superintendent, or if you have a particular need you have or what you've heard tonight, please do that. Because again, what I always like to point out, and I've been pointing out to them is the state funding we have, and even though it's gone up this year to a 3%, it is below the CPI. And for years, I mean, year upon year, we have been under CPI, and that's really a tough way for a business to exist because you're not keeping up with the cost increases and these are your state tax dollars that are going to the state and we're looking to bring them back we want to bring them back to the district that that's the whole goal um, for that so on our calendar we have the budget hearing coming up may 10th and then the vote uh, for the public for the four propositions and one board seat are, is on may 17th I can add one thing that Jane, you had a question about the um, impact of a lottery winner and uh, yeah, during our, uh, during our board, uh, okay. yep. during our board discussion, I was going to uh, ask the board if I could send a letter uh, regarding a bill that's being proposed um, that Im impacts what happens to a school budget with uh, when you have a, a mega lottery winner. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some local districts that have had this happen to them in the past. It could happen to any district at any moment. If you want to talk about that now so that they understand well, it, that's I fine. have a, just two slides to kind of show an example of, of how that impacts us. Okay. Um, what I presented, I think maybe two years ago, I talked about combined wealth ratio and that, that factor and how it plays into state aid. And we've seen our combined wealth ratio, which is an indication of our, our district's wealth compared to the rest of New York State. The statewide average they put out is one, and districts can be a, a below or above one. And we've seen our number go from 0.78, which is below, uh, in 10 years ago, to now it's 1.059. Um, so that, again, district as comparative to the rest of the New York State, they're seeing that our district is becoming wealthier relative to everyone else. And with that impact, you can see on this graph, um, you can see it's in small numbers, but the, the bars are really telling you, <laughs> Uh, on the top is showing how our combined wealth ratio is increasing. And you can see the impact it has on our expense-based aids, which are transportation aid, the SPOCES aid. As that number goes up, it's, it factors into our, our foundation aid. I'm not, well, it does impact foundation aid in a way, but it's not direct, it's hard to show. This is a really easy way to show that it's, it's impacting these, these expense-based aid categories. So as that combined wealth ratio goes up, they give us less money. They feel we're a wealthier district and we don't need as much money from the state is what the intention is of those formulas. Um, so that's a, just a direct way to show that. And, and you could see if there was a, a lottery winner, that combined wealth ratio, wealth ratio could go to 1.2 or 1.3, and we'd see those expense-based aid reimbursements that we get um, go down. And we've seen it, the one is 0 0.7, so for every dollar of transportation um, money we spent, we used to get 70 cents back. Now we get about 58 cents back on a dollar that we spent. So it's about an 18% loss uh, that we've seen just because that combined wealth ratio has gone up. And we don't see anything really changing in our district, but they're telling us that we're wealthier and we should get a little less state aid because of that. You know, John, I think uh, one of the problems with that is 
the statewide average of 1.0 for the combined wealth ratio as the only is the only number that I have ever seen since <laughs> I've been sitting on the board. That number has not changed, but we know obviously across New York State, those numbers had to change. The only thing that is actually changing is the individual combined wealth ratio number compared to that 1.0, which personally I do not feel is at 1.0 any longer. The problem, and a problem with the state funding, is they continue to plug these old inaccurate numbers into the formula year after year after year. It's showing us that, that we are a much wealthier region than we were 10 years ago. I've got news for you. Most areas in New York State are much better off than they were and wealthier than they were 10 years ago. But yet that number has not changed and we're being penalized by that year after year after year. Um, another one is uh, the, the way they assess the poverty level. You know, looking at our free and reduced lunches. Well, that's only if an individual actually applied for free and reduced lunches. I mean, during COVID, everyone was getting free and reduced lunches. You know, so how many people actually were applying? So that that inaccuracy alone shows our poverty rate at a at a much lower number than what it was. So correct. I think we were at about twenty percent on free reduced lunches, a little above even. And I think this year we're we're around 15, 16 percent. So just because of the free lunch, probably, and people aren't filling out the paperwork because they're already getting free lunch, so they don't feel they need to. We try, we push, we as hard as we can to get those people to put, send in that, those applications. But that's probably the well, logic is probably seeing the same thing. It's probably just. Yeah, I know our legislators are are starting to look at that particular you know formula and the way aid is distributed throughout the state to the various uh, districts. And, and I think I saw something posted on social media. I don't know which platform it was on, but uh, they were looking for input as far as that goes, the formula. Believe and it. if you have the opportunity yeah. to give input, it would be greatly appreciated, you know, from your expertise and your standpoint to let them know what's really happening. I believe the governor in her proposal uh, that she did in January, she allocated a certain amount of money to study the foundation, uh, Correct. Not the foundation, but the entire state aid formula process and how it works and to look at and, and under a, with a new set of eyes and maybe make some changes. So there's the opportunity. Well, hey, there. yeah, if there's any opportunity at the school district level, you know, primarily, you know, our business managers um, to become involved in that process, I, I would encourage <laughs> not only you, but your, you know, compadres uh, throughout Western New York. Absolutely. So, yep. Um, with regard to the free and reduced lunch program, um, that funding comes from the federal government. The reimbursement part of it does. Part of it's New York State, and but more, most of it is coming from the federal source. Yes. Yeah, and um, it's been supported through the pandemic, but they're looking at changing that, and right. um, no one is advocating to keep that program in place. And you know, clearly, uh, you know, it's difficult for people to ask for help. And that's understandable, but we definitely had ex additional people taking part. And even if you don't need help, sometimes it's nice not to make a lunch. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the summer at this point, the summer program will not be funded. Uh, right. And the, summer. that may um, roll over into the fall, too. So that's so, an indication that we may not get free. Correct. In, in so September. if anybody has any, um, I don't know. It'd be a great thing to call yeah, in. And talk for, to like, <laughs> um, yeah, call your representatives, email um, our senators, state our and federal, state and federal representatives, Congress people, senators, all of them, and tell them that we're still interested in that. And that goes for you know all students across the state. But someone mentioned that if you were forced to go to work every day, when we force students to go to school every day. Um, and be there for six hours and be attentive and respectful and behaving properly and not feed you for six hours, you know, people would be mad at work. 
Oh, yeah. Right? They'd be angry. And kids deserve that too. Very good. Yep. Thank you. I wanted to say, I thought that there was a bill that was introduced to continue free and reduced lunch in New York State, but I can't find it. So I hope so. There was one. Um, yeah, and I haven't seen one either, but. You know, please, um, just to let just let around the board know, and everyone in the public too, that uh, you can call John, call myself anytime you want any questions about the budget. Email us, and the presentation that we just saw will actually is going to be cut out of the recorded board meeting and posted on the business official or on our business website, which has a link to it about the budget. So if there's a piece you want to see, there's a piece you want to rewatch or play back to us when you talk to us. It'll be there for everyone to see um, up to and through the budget vote day. Great. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to our board discussion and news we're sharing. So the first item is the budget vote. Uh, it is on May 17th, as John said, from 7.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the intermediate gym. Um, because of that, our uh, budget hearing is on Tuesday, May 10th, um, and our board meeting is also on Tuesday, May 10th, which is unusual. We usually have our board meetings on a Wednesday, so take note, our May meeting is on a Tuesday this year, May, uh, Tuesday, May 10th. Um, Absentee ballot applications are available in the district office. If you need one, please contact our district clerk and she will mail one to you. Um, uh, the next item on this part of the agenda is the facilities naming policy committee. So do we have an update? So the committee did meet. Um, I was there with them and, and they actually came up was something they wanted to present to the board that would be in, should be in all the board docs, correct, Nora? Oh, yeah. For everyone to see. And so as you look through that, uh, questions, discussions, mm -hmm. things that you know, you know we can do now or maybe if the committee needs to re-meet um, so we can keep moving forward with that because everyone can see the progress um, with all the different projects we have going on. I mean, I, uh, I was fine with the uh, with what we ended up with with the final draft, but I, I believe Michelle, you had some changes that uh, you wanted to see or propose. Yeah, I had a, f a few. Just nothing significant uh -huh. in the um, intent of the policy. I don't think. Um, maybe just uh, some additions. I'd like. Um, I suggested. Um, to talk about the um, what's on the plaque, like if, if we decide to, um, he, I don't know, has, just have some consistency when we um, dedicate the facility and um, when that happens and how it's acknowledged. You know, um, usually there's like a small plaque placed and, you know, who's the date and the time and um, the superintendent and just kind of outlining what what information would go on that plaque, really. Um, I also suggested, um, sorry, I, oh, how, um, maybe outlining how we solicit for um, naming suggestions or the committee can do that. You know, do we put it on the website? Do we put it in the newspaper? Do we just see if anybody suggests something? Well, I, I think that that's covered under the name solicitation procedure. There shall be an established application form for individuals to submit suggested names to advisory committee upon receipt of any suggestions the district shall inform the public and request additional nominations the advisory committee shall solicit input from the public prior to convening for discussion 
I don't um our I, I don't know how detailed we want to get as far as you know how we're going to inform and request additional nominations. I mean, I, that's what we need to do. I don't know that we want to, you know, be very specific that we're going to, you know, use this outlet, this outlet, this outlet, da -da 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 -da, that may or may not be in place or still be in place, you know, in future years. But I guess um, we want to give notice to the public, right? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with giving notice, and that's where I'm kind of thinking of that, because I, I agree with both of you that we, you know, we were going to lock into certain ways in case they change, and you can see that with social media and, and how it changes and how that's going to change. And also thinking, we talked earlier about the facilities committee, maybe that's something about in the communication plan, they would talk about house, in this case, we use the word solicitation procedures would be posted, um, and that way that could always be revised, because I'm thinking this, but other things that might be going on in the district that that would want to be covered. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't put it into this policy, but also if we're going to be moved, which I do want to move forward with the communication, that could be something that could be a discussion point with that group too. Well, I mean, how I would do it now is I would post it on the website, post it on Facebook, use it in a connect that message. Um, but, and, yeah, and, and you can do yeah. it however you want. It just doesn't say that we even have to do that. Like, we don't have to oh. do anything right. There is no suggestion. Well, it does. It says, says to the public and, does, and request additional nominations. It says it right there. Upon receipt of any suggestions, the district shall inform the public and request additional nominations. That's yeah. Up, Upon receipt of a suggestion. So, okay, so just... It's just for clarification. I, I understand what you're saying that you, we know what we mean. We know what we mean when we write this. But upon receipt of any suggestions, how are we going to get any suggestions if we're not asking for them? Well, I think that any member of the community could come in and say, hey, I was thinking about it and I, I was looking at the auditorium and it's, it, I enjoyed the play and I was remembering Mr. Eaton and how about if we, uh, call the auditorium the Mr. Eaton Auditorium, because I want to remember him from when I was in school. Then that initiate, you say, okay, here's the application, and that initiates the process. Then the board um, gets that, informs the public, and says, we're Does anybody else have committee. anything? Mm -hmm. do, do we say, does anyone else have any Request. Yeah, that's, yes, that's what upon that receipt says. of any suggestions, the board shall inform the public and request additional nominations. That that to me says, are there so we're just going to we're, we're okay. And then you convene you convene your committee uh, mm -hmm. of the people that are in this committee compos uh, to, composition. To be honest, like um, I have a lot of changes that I wanted to suggest. It was a little bit later than when this final document was put into the board docs. And so I, I would, I'd like to request that our committee meet one more time before this is actually a final, I mean, it's still a draft, right? We haven't well, done Well, I, I, I think we should pull the rest of the board because, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, one I, of the ideas this was is to my have request. this completed, you know, prior to the new fiscal year. Um, what, and I rush? and again, you know, changes can always be made to our policies at at any point in time proposed. I'm not but sure. we've got to do three readings of the policy. So uh, if we approve the policy, or if we had a reading tonight, if if the this is board, a draft. Yeah, this the, is yeah, still the a draft. First we reading, can't even do a reading. First reading would be yeah. First reading would be until April twenty seventh. Okay, April right, April, May, May, and June. June. Yeah, and then it will be ready for is, us. The, is there a deadline to have this policy in place? No, but I think when we had talked before, I, I thought the aim was to try to have a policy in place before the new fiscal year. I thought it was so before the facility was completed. Well, the facility is going to be completed, I understand, um, 
this fall. Yes. Yeah, it'd be September. So yeah. the fiscal so year lots, starts July 1st and so we'd, facilities we'd like September. So have this in place so that then you can convene a committee mm -hmm. to see if we're going to name that facility. Okay. I, I mean, I guess I, my request is, all I'm saying is I'm requesting. You guys, you know, of course we're going to ask the board members. That's how this works, mm -hmm. right? It's just my request that we meet one more time to um, iron out some clarifications and some rewording of things. That's all. That's my request. If, if no one else agrees, that's fine. <clears throat> Well, I'm fine with with going with the uh, the draft proposal at this point in time. I, I think the draft proposal it looks good. I but you haven't seen my changes, so well, I'm sorry. You're talking the, the one change you're talking about. I don't see the need for it. I think that what you're asking for is already in it. And I, I know. In terms of PEC consistency, the rest of the changes though. I, I'm well, I guess it would be respectful to even just look at them. But if you don't agree with them, that's fine. I'm just asking for the opportunities to submit them to people to look well, at. I, I guess the question is, is the board satisfied with the policy as written or, do, or does the board wish the committee to reconvene? Right. And I know both uh, Louise and myself were fine with the draft. But I'm not going to speak for Louise. She can speak for herself. Well, I think, I think yeah, it is a draft. And I think that um, if we have to do some tweaking to it, that makes sense. Yeah, but yeah, the I question agree. was, yeah. Louise, did you have any, when you received the final draft and um, the board clerk asked for any changes or suggested changes? Were you asking for any You're right. changes? You're right. I guess I didn't see that either about we're going to wait for somebody to send a suggestion in. Um, I guess I missed it. I think if Michelle has feedback, we should discuss it. Um, we do have time before, you know, there's no deadline on this. So I think if we need a little bit more time, I think we should allow for that. So we could get can we uh, cover it on this? It's up to their schedule, but we could we could have another committee meeting before mm -hmm. April twenty seventh, and then they could present it to. I don't think it will take very long. No, and if well, it, no, but you know, it won't take. Very long. You know, and I'm just playing meetings out of my head as we talk about this because if, if even if we could make our schedules before the twenty seventh, you would still have the May meeting. Um, the June meeting, and then we have the reorg meeting, like the first of, which would be the third reading, which is the first, second, third of July. Um, I don't, I don't remember the date. I apologize, but it's July fifth, sixth, July sixth. So you would have a, a May, June, and July sixth meeting. That's fine. Okay. All right. So we'll reconvene the uh, the committee before the next board meeting. Well, uh, in attempts before the next board meeting, but if it can't fit in, then because um, I know I'm not here next week, so I wouldn't be available. I mean, you can meet without me, but I wouldn't be here next week. Um, I don't know other people's schedules, and but if it couldn't, it would still be okay if it was a little bit after that. I would think we would try to definitely meet before the May board meeting. Maybe that month's right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right, the next one is the letter um, that I would like to send to um, our local legislators and to the uh, chairs of the Education Committee for the Senate and the chair of the Education Committee for the Assembly. Um, do I, should I read the letter? So the, yeah, I would for the here. public. Um, as the Iroquois Central School District's Board of Education, we urge you to support Bill S08701 relating to excluding certain lottery winnings from a school district's gross income, uh, adjusted gross income, provides that any lottery winnings in excess of 25% of the district's adjusted gross income shall be excluded from 
such district's gross income for the year. While our district does not face this type of hardship, we are aware of the effects a lottery winner can have on our school budget. When many see billboards on the highway announcing the Powerball payout at say $160 million, for example, they begin daydreaming about new homes and cars for every member of their family. However, we think about what programs and which teachers will have to be suspended or cut to make up for the shortfall in the budget because the increase of the gross income would reduce state aid to the district that cannot be compensated for in the tax levy. This bill is a simple fix that would ensure one lucky person's windfall does not negatively impact the education of the students in the same community. Thank you for voting yes. On behalf of the Iroquois Central School Board of Education, Jane Sullivan, President. Um, would everybody be okay with me sending that? Yeah. I, I would yes. for sure. Again, that goes back to that combined wealth ratio number again, and you know, especially with the uh, smaller school districts, Lakeshore. Yeah, Lakeshore. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it just skews the numbers. Every time there's a lottery winner in New York State, it happens to a school district. Yeah, I, I hate and, to say and it. I would hate to. I would hate to begrudge one of my neighbors and their windfall. That, I was just going to say that. I wish everybody luck, but I hope you don't live in our district. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right. So I'll be sending that letter out. Um, trying to get used to a new system for those of you out in the in the public watching. Um, we're moving to board docs and everything is on our computer. So, uh, And all my notes are there. Um, does anybody else have any concerns or celebrations that they would like to bring forward that are not on the agenda? I do. Okay. One, um, I went to the uh, high school musical. Phenomenal. It was like reliving the 80s all over again. It was fantastic. <laughs> the jumpsuit is what I like. The jumpsuit. Oh my God. <laughs> Somebody had on like, like gloves that would have the fingers cut off yes and paint up were like bright pink and i swear like somebody stole my earrings from 1986. <laughs> um it was a, it was just so good um several people commented on how deep our talent is you know um from the leads to the supporting um actors and the the dancing and the singing was just fantastic also, the um, high school band concert was last night, and um, also amazing to see those kids um, performing and enjoying being on stage. And um, the Pops concert is coming up, and it's um, Mr. Ayako made the point that only the seniors have ever experienced a Pops concert because yeah, of all the cancellations. Children. So. Um, it's, it is one of the, the most enjoyable concerts of the year if um, anybody has you know the opportunity the to come. Uh, yes, I what do. What does that, Michelle? I yeah. cannot say it right now. While you, keep, while you keep talking, I'll see if I can Don't find it on my it. calendar. <laughs> it may be in my... Let's see. I thought I had the program from last night in my purse, but I can't find it. I think it's May. Is it June 2nd? I don't know. I'm so sorry. I, I will. But it might still be snowing in May. Mm -hmm. uh, they are marching in the Memorial Day Parade for Alma. That has been on hold for a couple of years also. And then, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure the superintendent will find it. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. I just, um, and I then just want to be Nora and finding it. <laughs> and talking about the budget vote, um, I think most people are aware of this, but um, the seat will be open. I'm not running again. I never planned on being here for 10 years. Um, and yet here I am. Uh, but I will not be going for 11. So um, it, I, I was thinking on the way here that when I was on the board, my daughter was in eighth grade. She's now a music teacher. Um, my middle son graduated in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic and missed out on his senior year. Um, thank God he's over it. I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are too, us. It's hard. Uh, and my youngest is um, 
moving on faster than I thought he might be. So um, I truly have been so fortunate to be a part of this board. Um, all of the people that we've worked with over the past 10 years, it's been amazing. I've learned so much. When I first started, I um, had like acronym overload because <laughs> I did not speak edu speak, education speak, holy mackerel. I think it took me two years to figure out what um, Dr. Dudek was saying sometime. <laughs> um, so I, I truly am appreciative of this community, the support, um, the focus on students that this board maintains. I hope that continues. And um, I truly hope that the community takes into account when people are running um, their views on education that um, over the past 10 years, I can't tell you how many immediate needs and um, topics came up that, you know, seem to take our focus away from the education of students um, and then went away. And the education continues. And um, we need to support our faculty and staff, the students, um, keep moving them in the right direction and not be distracted by political, um, I don't know, I guess talking points of the moment because they do change rapidly. And then um, a five-year term is very long. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I don't know, I, I guess that's my point. I, I truly hope that people run because they care about the long-term education of the students. And, um, and this district is, is great and um, the board is full of really great people who care deeply about the future and the education of our students. So I will miss everybody. Uh, but not for a few months. Now we even have an extra <laughs> meeting, so bonus. Well, you know, well, first off, you can it, always it come back in March, and, Michelle. <laughs> you can always come back and join the audience. You don't have to disappear. Oh, but, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but really, or maybe worry. <laughs> but thank you, really, really thank you. I mean, you're you right. Ten years is is a long time, and and the different things that have come up, and while well, you've been in your tenure on the board, and how they've been handled you know with you and the board has been phenomenal so we really appreciate everything you've done the questions you've asked because sometimes people are afraid to ask a question and there are questions that need to be asked in education and everything else um really for if nothing else reflection pieces but then from that reflection what do you what are you going to do um so really you know from the school you know from i want to speak for administration but i say mr Vito nodding too thank you from administration and everything out there for what you did for the students, for the teachers, for the administrators, um, you know, for all of Iroquois. And, you know, just to help you out right before you leave, June 2nd is the Pops concert. Oh, I was right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> leave the LP right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'd like to say on behalf of the board that we absolutely appreciate your 10 years of dedicated service to the district. Um, coming back after being a student. <laughs> Um, and working to uh, help make sure that uh, our district maintains its standards. Um, I can say um, one of my first meetings, I sat next to you and I was just like a, a deer in headlights going, what am I doing? And you so kindly leaned over and said, don't worry, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll learn all the acronyms, you'll learn what we're doing, it, you know, you don't have to always talk. <laughs> You'll be fine. Ask questions. I, I learned a lot about how to be a board member for yourself. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate it. And five years really isn't that long. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you no, it's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no. And, and I think that's why we have such a, a good board is because of those five-year terms. Most boards have, or I shouldn't say most, there are a lot of boards that only have three-year terms. So there's never really, you know, a cohesiveness to the board. 
you can have a total board changeover, you know, in that three year, you know, period. Whereas the way we have our seats staggered, there is always, you know, tenure board members, you know, to help new board members. And uh, I, I think that's made a difference and you've made a difference. So thank you. Thank you. As a new board member, I cannot believe like <laughs> how quick, quickly a year has gone by. Um, you know, but yeah, Michelle, thank you for, for everything. And um, I'm sure we'll see you for, okay. for the rest of the board meetings and, and, and your term and uh, at, at meetings to come. So thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, and uh, that leads me to something that I've asked for. Um, I am the uh, board representative to the Iroquois Foundation for the Wall of Fame Committee. Um, they are meeting uh, to decide um, this coming year's recipient. Um, and I, for personal reasons, will not be able to serve on that committee after all. And uh, in reaching out to board members, Michelle, you did say that you would be doing, you would be willing to do that for me. So, like I said, you're not done. <laughs> <laughs> and you're unless ready somebody, more. <laughs> in, unless somebody else really wants to do it, I, I think Michelle should do it because I remember when I first got on that committee, she was interested in being on it. So I'd like to see Michelle do that on, yeah, on behalf of the board. For a couple months, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. So, um, meeting on the 18th. Yeah, Mondays are good for me, so that's okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, let's see. A reminder that we do have a meeting on April 27th. That's uh, uh, it's unusual for us to have two meetings in one month, but we do um, because we're doing the proceeds. Uh, vote, right? Yep, vote yep. For, and we might have a... Uh, so now it sounds like we might also talk about our... Could possibly have the naming policy. So there, um, what time is that meeting again? It's at 7.30 in the morning. Okay. 7.30 a.m. April 27th at 7.30 a.m. Mark your calendars, folks. It's a quick one, right? It's typically it should a quick be. one. It should be. Yeah. Yeah, that's... that's yeah, we might have a couple new hires on that too. We, we actually um, okay. have someone that we're looking to start in September. We're trying to get ahead of that, especially with the employment market. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, ECASB, uh, I, uh, there's a delegate meeting on April 7th, tomorrow. Uh, I know that Heather cannot uh, attend and her alternate also cannot attend. Is there anybody else who would be available to go? You can't because you are right. I, I was going to say I'd be happy, but I've got yeah, so I, I can cover that. I can kind of do a purpose, I think. So, all right. Um, and then, um, April 21st is the last legislative meeting at ECASB. Um, April 28th uh, is the field trip for getting to know your BOCES. So we're taking a field trip down to Springville to see the PTEC program. If you haven't registered to do that, uh, it's it's a really great uh, opportunity to see what the PTEC program is all about. We do send students to the PTEC program, don't we? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know if there's one in this year, but I know we do look to send them every single year, and we have sent them. So that would be uh, fun, and I'll be going if anybody wants a ride. Uh, and then um, May 5th is the May speedboarding event, and the annual dinner is on June 9th. So mark the calendars. There's some fun stuff that CASB happening. I have nothing fun, but uh, I will be attending the annual meeting of uh, Erie Two Boses tomorrow evening. So um, I'm sure uh, I'll have a lot of information to bring back. <laughs> At least, uh, hopefully, you know, see what services they're they're expanding and. Uh, you know what their plans are you know moving into the future and how it might impact our students yeah we do send a lot of students and they do have great programs yes they do okay if there's nothing else i'll turn it over to mr schofield for the superintendent report uh one thing i do have that wasn't put on the agenda because it, it received afterwards the capital project um as you drive by you can see what's happening across the road and, and I did mean to get this out of my Monday message, so I apologize to technology that I didn't get it there, but we have another time-lapse video up on the website 
So it's nice to watch what happens, but watching it from an aerial view of everything moving around and growing, you can really see that that's great to see. And the other one that I received, actually uh, today, today the 6th, is that the uh, solar system, the solar panels that we're installing on the Morella primary roof, they will be going up um, next week and uh, during, the, during the week of recess. And then they're going to be working on and getting out everything running over the next couple weeks after that. So hopefully that will help John with his savings and, and make it a little more green for everybody by having the solar panels there. COVID update, uh, you see the reports. We do send them out on Fridays now, and then I also do them on my Monday message. Um, we did have a little stint a couple weeks ago where there were six, seven people. Um, don't quote me on it. The, the messages are out there at the high school, but really since break, it's been very low. Uh, this past week, there was only one in one building. So that is going very well with that. The If you look at the Buffalo News, and I read it, that the um, county executive says he's going to be sending out air filters for every single room in Erie County for all the school rooms. And that, that's nice. But uh, if you remember here at Iroquois, we've already taken care of that. Uh, we didn't go with HEPA, but we went another way of breaking down the particle. So I will be exploring to see if there's a different way we can use that funding since we have things in place. Um, but if not, we will be using these in the rooms when they come and where they are needed. The, that really leads nice with COVID into my next, top, next topic, test kit distribution. In the Monday message, I told everyone if you're interested in receiving test kits, and I will use plural this time, um, send in a note of how many you would like. Um, really, our usage has gone way down with COVID reducing. So if your family would like you know, one for every child, one for your grandma, uh, grandparents, and one for the parents. Send in what you would like and we will send them home. Uh, we will take care of one of every student that requests first, and then we, we will be sending home the other ones as much as we can. So please do that. Or if your child, the big thing is, uh, has a sign or symptom, and you don't have a test kit at home to test them, call in uh, um, or come in and get one. You don't call ahead of time. Don't just show up, please. And we will have a test kit for you. Um, testing is a great way to, to make sure and to stop any possible thing that's happening. Any questions on that from anyone? The next one is that social media safety committee update that I've been meeting with. And there was one that was just canceled, unfortunately, just with the schedules and everything. And this week we couldn't meet. But there are things that came out of the meeting before that we, are, we move forward with. And one idea they had is if there's something going on in your room, and you try to call the office, what happens if the phones are busy or you dial the first number, then the second number, then the third number, that takes a lot of time. And so technology was able to put in place where there will be a number any teacher can call and like six phones will ring. And so each building is putting down that list. They already gave it to tech, they're setting that up. And so that'll be in place. You dial this number, all those phones ring, someone grabs it and right away you have someone that is going to get and start implementing assistance to the room. Um, so it would be nurses, the secretarial staff in the office, principals, and so on. So that's a great feature. Um, we also, they said, you know, locking the buildings in the summer, that was a concern. Um, we did do it where classes are happening in the buildings. We look at the main campus, it's all interconnected. So therefore, we will be having the doors locked. Or the Boys and Girls Club comes over here, we're working with them. And that, that, that one was, I don't want to say easy, but the, the logistics of it were easy to overcome. The one that we're going to be getting a committee on to figure out is after school, because the same thing with after school, if events are going on, having things open, um, and how are you going to do that? How are you going to manage the door? So if you think of the high school musical, which was fabulous, coming in, there was someone at the door checking everyone. So that, you know, the doors would be open and come in the same way. But on days where there's just practices, how would we manage that with students going in and out, having to use the facilities and so on? And so that's why we're going to get, uh, committee on that. So that is some great work that they're implementing and we're moving forward on. Any questions there? Regents exams, we did receive, and Doug will correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Beto. Um, Regents exams are all happening this year. So uh, last year they did reduce some of them, um, but there's no waiver from the federal government. And um, last year there was a waiver, so some of them are reduced this year. There's no waiver from the federal government and New York sta State has um, believes and is acting on having them all happen. 
the three through eight testing has happened. Dr. Dudek will talk about that. Um, and, and so that will be coming up next. In fact, it's going to turn right into her right with that right now. So go ahead, it's all yours. Thanks. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about the UPK. Can you guys hear me? Uh, I don't know, does that come in through on the mic? Tap it a couple of times. It says it's on. I can't hear anything here. Very, very faint. Can I just tap it? Thank you, sir. First, I'm going to talk about the UPK program. Um, <clears throat> this year, as of as we did last year, we had over 70 applicants uh, for 38 spots. Last Friday, we held uh, a lottery raffle. And on Monday, we notified the parents of the children who were chosen via the raffle, or, or the lottery, excuse me. Um, and then on Tuesday, we began notifying families of those who unfortunately were not chosen via the lottery. And we let that, we, re, we also released where they would be on the wait list because oftentimes due to unforeseen circumstances some families choose not to use the space that they were given through the lottery right now we are working on finalizing the locations um, so that's the upk update as mr schofield spoke about we had our three through eight ELA assessments. And um, in 2019, it was the last year prior to COVID that our data for the assessments was used for any state or federal uh, um, reporting. And that was through the ESSA report. And I can say that we, based on, when we compare the 2019 to this year's opt-out rates, we did improve by 12%. So 12, roughly 12% 12 more students in our district participated in the ELA three through eight uh, assessment. Um, I just wanna point out that we still need to continue to work towards improving and getting to that 95%. Um, because if we have too high of an opt-out rate in the coming years, and, and um, that could mean that we as a district or as an individual school could be identified as a school in, or a district in need of review. And that would mean having um, possible outside organizations coming in to help us. So we're gonna continue working on improving our participation rates for three through eight. Um, three through eight math will be happening after Easter break. Question, Ms. Speck? Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's a question, but it's it's that 95% that rate, which, you know, doesn't take into account, you know, parental choice, uh, how and who came up with that number, you know, to make a determination, you know, whether or not, you know, we're, we're in a, a school of need. Um, is there any talk of coming up with, I mean, we, 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 we encourage, you know, our, our parents and students to, to participate, but when it comes down to it, it's the parent's choice whether their child is going to participate or not and to hold that over a district's head and to penalize a district because a parent is making a choice on behalf of their child is absolutely ludicrous so let me if i could just give you a little bit of just a short history uh the 95 percent is actually a federal mandate not a state mandate and it actually came about as a, a part of the 
um, No Child Left Behind back in the early 2000s. And the reason why it was put into place was um, there were, there was research done that identified schools from around the country that may have selected students to be not participating for whatever reason. And so that's why they put it into place. It's really important though for our participation rate for as many students to take because it also affects not just the participation rate, but now because of ESSA and the guidelines put into ESSA by the federal government, um, those students that don't sit for that assessment, there is a part of the ESSA piece that also impacts our overall score because those students that didn't sit are essentially counted as zeros. And so it, it hurts us twice. And, and yes, it helps us identify possible problems with our students, but it really ultimately gives us a good idea about the programs that we use in our district. And, and, and I understand the value, you know, that if, if the data, you know, is openly shared and, and we can actually utilize it because we did go through that period mm -hmm. where it's like, why are, why are we testing? Um, but again, to, to take a district and, or, or a school building, you know, and deem it as being in, in need, I mean, it, it, it just seems so ludicrous and such a waste. I, it, you, you have, you're, you're making an arbitrary, or you're not, I, yeah, don't get me I wrong. The government <laughs> is making an arbitrary. I think Mary Jo's doing it. The yeah. government <laughs> is making an arbitrary, you know, decision here that because we had less than 95% of our students participate, we could deem you a school in need and that would translate, I would imagine, into more programs and help that would that we would need to supply at taxpayers' expense. When all of this is just based on what ninety-five percent. Well, but that was that was in the olden days, and now ESSA not only counts participation, but then they also do another count that compares how students performed. And they do a count on, they, they see how students performed, who took the test. And then in another column, they take all of the students who should have taken the test. And that's where those zeros get included. And that's where it hurts us worse than the participation rate. Well, because I, I, our students historically score very well on these assessments. And, and so it, it hurts us in that it, it takes our resources away, right, exactly. our time. And, and so participation rates being high and, and having kids participate mitigates that. Yeah, exactly. And, and to your point, they, that number hurts us. Well, how, I get I your mean, point. I, I, you know, if we're here for the for the education of our kids, and and I understand value, you know, for for testing so that we can see progress, and you know, we can the state and federal government can do comparisons with you know different uh, uh, districts and demographics, whatever have you. But knowingly penalizing school districts based on a parent's decision and their right to make that decision mm -hmm. just seems so counterproductive, such a waste of time and money and effort for everybody. I would love them to see, to, to come up with a better way of, of doing this. And I'll just make one final point. When they were bringing in ESSA, we at, across the state, because every state decided on their regulations. Um, and that was the one thing that New York State did is they brought together all the focus groups. And the, the point of ESSA and the point of those changes was just to ensure that all subgroups are not forgotten because we have some subgroups 
that would typically not be counted because of the size. And so they just want to make sure that everyone is taken care of. I take your point. It makes total sense. It's very difficult to convince someone, a family or whomever, that doesn't want to sit for an assessment. It's very difficult. And that's why we we are just going to keep trying to improve. No, I, I, you know, again, I, it's just frustrating I, to me. I share when, your frustration. When, when, when I see organizations that are supposed to be, you know, helping us with, with the education to to make policies like that that are going to actually, you know, penalize, you know, based on, on a choice that we don't have control over. I understand and, that. And, you know, so I, I won't say any more, but I just needed to get that off my chest again because it, it, it bothers me so much. We're all here volunteering our time, yeah. you know, a month after month and, you know, week after week with all of the things we're, we're involved in and trying the best for our students. And then we have a government telling us, well, you know what? Yeah, we understand it's beneficial, yeah. but we you also need to understand we don't have control of personal choices. So don't penalize our district and our the rest of our students because of that. That's all. Thanks. I'm done. I, I won't no, say anymore. No, you're right? good. Look you're good. Your but I, I understand where you're yeah. coming from. I just have one other item, and that is um, for the last few days, um, the teachers have been participating in a needs assessment survey for summer professional development. Um, we're getting pretty good re uh, responses and I'll be using that along with uh, the administrators to build and the technology department to build our summer staff development and also uh, lay the foundation for next year's professional development throughout the year. Thank you. Uh, two more things. Uh, budget vote absentee ballots has already talked about a little bit. Um, just in terms of the absentee ballots, it, the governor, yes, it was the governor signed a bill that uh, voters to um, obtain absentee ballots from school, from school district for votes um, based if they had any concerns with COVID. So if you have any concerns, please contact the district clerk Everything's on the website for you to get an absentee ballot because I always love to have as many people vote as possible. The other thing in terms of the budget, uh, this email that came out on the 31st says, um, you've been made, you may be holding out hopes for a last minute on time budget deal. And then on the 5th, which was yesterday, budget talks continue to be painfully slow. Um, the governor has sent the houses a temporary extender that will um, take care of payroll and different things for the state funding as they keep working on it. And this is through the seventh. So I am not sure that's tomorrow where they will be then. The budget talks continue to be dominated by conversations regarding um, items that are non-educational. Um, now, uh, what I have here for recognitions is uh, a uh, the musical was great. We talked about that already, but also um, about two weeks ago, 14 of our talented young musicians participated in the ECMEA Senior High All-County Festival at UB. I talked to a few of them. They really enjoyed it, had a great time, saw the pictures. Um, I talked to the music teachers that took them down there. They went from band, orchestra, and chorus, and they really did an outstanding job representing Iroquois in a spectacular fashion, and the performances were nothing but short of stunning. Um, high school musical. Uh, if ever the board members look, you should have something that's titled Donations for Ukraine. So Elma Marilla, they have been doing some fundraising with the students. And where this came from, this presentation was actually from Marilla. And this is where the fourth graders actually went and made different committees. Some of them were making the posters in the hall. Some of them made this PowerPoint. Other ones were doing presentations to the other students in there at lunches. And this really put it together of how to be advocates later in their life. So that was great to see. Um, I don't know. I, I know the principals called over and said, do we have a truck? 
um, a larger truck that we can take everything that was donated over there and they got toiletry, uh, uh, infant supplies and clothing. I did see chocolate on here too, to take over um, to, so they could be taken over and sent to Ukraine. So congratulations to those young um, advocates there. Um, we have two new this year social workers in the high school and the uh, one of them is the supervisor for character counts club and what they will be having right now they'll be selling shirts as fundraisers for it's okay not to be okay um, because this deals with mental health and there's a walk for that so if you want to participate support that would be great all the money from this will be going to the rock all the money from the walk raised from that marathon walk will be going to the rock and also be selling stuff from a concession stands there and that will be going to the fish. Why I mentioned this is because those are both things that heavily support students here at Iroquois. Um, this is would take place on the high school on 520. Um, so next month on the 20th. How far is it? I don't think there's any distance in here that I saw. I, I think it's kind of really what you want to do, what you can handle. So I will be the one at the concession stand. <laughs> I already bought my shirt, Nora already bought her shirt. So, you know, buy the shirts and come, come and, you know, go to the concession stand because I think that's how they're raising the money. <laughs> I can walk to the concession stand. I can handle that. Um, and, and that's what I have for recognition. So back over to you, Jane. No, we do not have any recognition of guests. Okay, so that brings us to uh, discussion of agenda items 11.1 through 24.12. I love board docs, it gives us a lot more numbers. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to point out that Chris Hershey is in the audience. He is going to join the administrative team as the director of special education. There's really a much longer title that you have to write every time you sign your name. Um, but congratulations, welcome on board. He will be starting in June and uh, um, there'll be a little overlap so he can get his feet wet and learn all the different nuances of Iroquois. Congratulations, welcome on board. Thank you very much. And yes, I want to say hi to you afterwards. <laughs> Another four hours just to let you know. <laughs> uh, any other discussion? Okay, can I have a motion? Uh, well, actually, is there a request to withdraw specific items from the agenda? Okay. Is there a request to add a specific item to the agenda? Then can I have a motion to approve the consensus agenda 11.01 .01 through 24.12? So move, Louise. Sorry, Louise, I already got Michelle. <laughs> you wanna second it? Second, Louise. Okay. All in favor? I can't Hi. see Michelle and uh, Heather, so. Or, I'm sorry, Louise. I'm Louise and Heather. It's hard to, it's easy to mix this up. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, are they, can you oh, see them? them? Louise, yep, they said hi. Okay. Uh, yes. I, mean, I did say yes. I think, we're, I think I said yes. I think we're overlapping. Yes. Okay. And that would mean no no's, and the motion carries. Um, takes us to oh, recognition of guess. guests. Do we have any? No. First, okay. Uh, we do not need an executive session, do we? Do not. Okay. Uh, or, at then, least I don't. <laughs> uh, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second, Louise. Sorry, Louise, I got Michelle. Sorry. All in favor. Any discussion? No. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. It's unanimous. Both it's unanimous. Meeting is adjourned. They chuckled. They chuckled get his wish. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, everyone, nice and, um, for attending nice virtually. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy Florida.